John chapter 1 beginning in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of, the, of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. <clears throat> Each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written by different men as inspired and directed by the Lord. They were written by, with different specific audiences in mind and together provide five, uh, four accounts of the life of Jesus. John, the son of Zebedee, is the author of this Gospel. He and his brother James are called the sons of thunder, most likely because of their lively, zealous personalities. Of the twelve disciples, John, James, and Peter form the inner circle, chosen by Jesus to be his closest companions. They had the exclusive privilege of witnessing and testifying about the events in the life of Jesus that no others were invited to see. John was present at the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. He was there at the transformation of Jesus and in Gethsemane. John was also the only recorded disciple to be present when Jesus was crucified. He is the one Jesus spoke to from the cross when he told John to take care of his mother. And he told his mother Mary that John would take care of him. To say that John and Jesus were close would probably be an understatement because I would not give just anybody the responsibility of taking care of my mother. John tells us a great deal about the life and the ministry of Jesus, things that other writers do not tell us. John tells us about the marriage feast at Cana of Galilee, of the coming of Nicodemus to visit Jesus in the middle of the night. He tells about the woman of Samaria. He tells us about the raising of Lazarus. Of the way that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And of Jesus teaching about the Holy Spirit and calling him the counselor. John pays careful attention to everything going on around him. He gives us details that the other writers in the Bible don't give us. When Jesus feeds the 5,000 with some loaves and fish, John is the only one that tells us those loaves were loaves of barley bread. When Jesus walked on the water and came to the disciples in the middle of the storm, John is the one who tells us that they were between three and four miles from the shore when the storm came. He is the one who tells us there were six stone water pots that Jesus changed into wine. Only John tells us about the crown of thorns and how the soldiers gambled for Jesus' woven garment. He knows the exact weight of the aloes and myrrh that was used to anoint Jesus' body to prepare it for burial after his crucifixion. John remembers how the perfume of the ointment filled the house when Jesus was anointed. These are the memories of the man who was there. In the beginning part of this chapter, John tells us about things he did not directly see or know. These are things the Lord showed him and wanted him to record. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. John wasn't there when those things occurred, but God had told him about them. 
There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. And John the disciple tells us about John the Baptist and his ministry and work. But in verse 14, John begins to share some of his God-inspired and God-directed memories. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Most of us are familiar with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're familiar with the account of how God loved man enough to send his son Jesus Christ. We're familiar with that verse. But many refer to verse 14 in this chapter as the second greatest verse in the entire Bible. For it tells us in that verse how God did that. Jesus came to earth and became a man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Oh, the love that God must have for us to cause his son to lead the glories and the splendor and the paradise of heaven to have to come to live and dwell here with us. Oh, how many times at a funeral have I talked about the glories of heaven? About the place where there is no pain and no sorrow and no sickness, no hurt, no grief, no tears. A place where we never again have to say goodbye. There's no heartache, no heartbreak, no death. Don't know about you, but when I get there, I never want to leave again. And I cannot imagine a love that would cause me to send my son from a place such as that to a place where he would be hated and despised, spit upon, beaten and a crown of thorns pressed into his scalp. And yet the love of God for us caused his son to come and do that. But John, who had the opportunity to walk with Jesus Christ for three and a half years, one of, one of his closest confidants, the one upon whom Jesus rested at the Lord's Supper, one of the three invited to go with him apart in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with him on the night before he was crucified. John, such a, uh, an observer of details, the intricate things, John, of these things, what jumped out at you most about Jesus? And in verse 14, he says, We observed his glory, full of grace and truth. A number of years ago, a large international conference was held of religious leaders from around the world. In the midst of that conference, a debate broke out, a discussion about what it was that made Christianity unique, separate, distinct from every other religion and every other cult in the world. Some argued that it was God coming in flesh that set Christianity apart from other religions. But they decided that wasn't it because other religions claimed that their gods also became men. Some argued that it was love or sacrifice or the resurrection or one thing or another. Each idea being shot down. Finally, C.S. Lewis, having arrived late, walked in and wanted to know what all the arguing and the discussion was. And they explained they were trying to figure out what it was to set Christianity apart from every other religion, from every cult in the world. He said, oh, that's simple. It is grace. And how true it is, my friends, the tr thing that sets Christianity apart from every other religion, from every cult in the world, is grace. The unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. 
And I want you to know this morning, my friends, that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is enough. Save your places and turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Second Corinthians chapter 12 beginning in verse 7. Therefore so that I would not exalt myself a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me but he said to me my grace is sufficient for you for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 we read that Paul was complaining. He had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. We don't know if it was a physical problem he couldn't overcome. We don't know if it was a temptation he struggled with regularly. We don't know if it was an attitude he battled with. We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. We do know that this thorn in the flesh was brought by a messenger of the devil. And we do know that Paul prayed several times that God would take it away and God never did. There are those who will tell you that if you pray and don't see a positive answer to your prayer... It's because you don't believe enough or you don't have enough faith. Horse feathers. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers for the same reason I didn't give Drew everything he wanted when he was growing up. Because God knows better. Paul prayed three times to have a storm removed and God said no. And instead of answering Paul's prayer, God said my grace is sufficient. That means God's grace is enough. Turn to someone sitting beside you and tell them God's grace is enough. If you don't have anything else, God's grace is enough. God's grace is enough to save you. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 we read, For by grace we saved through faith, and this is not yourselves, it is God's gift. I want you to know this morning that God's grace is enough to save you. You realize that there is nothing you can do to earn your salvation. You cannot be good enough. The Bible says the best that you can hope to do, your best works, are like filthy rags compared to God's holiness. You can never be good enough to be saved. You can never go to church enough. You can never give enough to the church. You can never help enough poor people. You can never visit enough prisons or light enough candles or pray enough to earn being saved. It is only by God's grace that you are saved. So quit trying to be good enough to be saved and trust Jesus. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and dine with him and sup with him and he with me. God's grace is enough. It's enough to save you. And God's grace is enough to seal you. Look with me, if you will, please, in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. The law came along to multiply the trespass. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says that the law of God opened my eyes. I saw myself. I saw my sin. I saw who I really was. My sin increased, but God's grace increased even more. You realize that if you are truly born again, if Jesus is really your Savior, if you are saved, then you are signed and just waiting to be delivered. You can never lose your salvation. 
When you invite Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, he comes in to live, to stay forever. The Holy Spirit stays with you. John chapter 10, Jesus said, The sheep the Father has given me are in my hand, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. They are in the Father's hand, and no one can snatch them out of God's hand. A number of years ago, Gladys Drew and I took a trip out west. Now, this is not the first nor only time that Drew and I have been doing something and other people have walked by and commented on what those stupid people were doing. <laughs> on this particular trip, we went to the Grand Canyon and we went to Zion National Park and, and uh, uh, we went and saw a volcano that was out there. We went to the Petrified Forest and saw some Indian cliff dwellings and all of that. One of the things Drew and I enjoyed the most while we were out there was the climbing. Drew and I climbed mountains and rocks and hills. That was 16 years ago when Drew was only four. Often Drew and I climbed places many adults wouldn't climb, much less take their children. And any time we climbed some steep or high places, I always had Drew's hand. I would take him and push him up on the ledge ahead of me or I would climb up and reach down and grab his hand and pull him up. And each time we were climbing those cliffs and climbing those mountains, I was hanging on to Drew's hand. Now let me ask you, what was it that kept Drew safe? Was it him hanging on to his daddy's hand or his daddy hanging on to him? It was daddy hanging on to him. Because daddy's hand was much bigger and much stronger than his was. And some of you people are still living like your salvation depends on your grip on God. You're afraid you'll sin and he'll quit loving you. You're afraid you'll mess up and lose your salvation. And so you go from one day to the next never knowing if you're still good enough to be saved. Well guess what? You're not. And neither am I. But my salvation doesn't depend on me living good. And it doesn't depend on my good works. And it doesn't depend on me hanging on to God. It depends on God hanging on to me. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, we read, He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Christ Jesus. During the building of the Golden Gate Bridge over the San Francisco Bay, construction fell behind schedule terribly. You see the bridge was very high in the air and even though it was over water, the majority of the workers when they'd fall would die. And out of fear, the workers moved very slowly in constructing the bridge. The engineers, the architects, tried to figure out what they could do to make construction move more quickly. And finally, they decided they'd erect a, a large net under the entire bridge so the workers wouldn't have to worry about falling anymore. And even though it cost them a lot of money, that's what they ended up doing. Within a short time, two workers fell from the bridge and they landed in the net. The workers, the other workers seeing that the net would save them began to work more quickly, began to work much faster because they were no longer afraid. My friend, you and I need to quit living in fear and trust the grace grip of your heavenly Father. God's grace is enough to save you. And it is enough to secure you, to seal you. And God's grace is enough to change you. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, we read, Now the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus will personally restore, establish, strengthen, and support you. God, because of and through his grace, will change you. It will restore you. Some of you, like Paul, may feel like the chief of sinners. You feel like you can never get a grip on life again. You feel
feel like you can never be clean, you can never be forgiven, you can never go back. You say, Brother Gene, if you only knew what I've done, you know I could never have a close relationship with God again. He'll never take me back. You're right. You can't go back. But you can go on. Because God will restore your relationship with him. David, after sinning with Bathsheba and after having her husband killed, cried out, My sins are always before me. How in the world can I go on when I'm always remembering the terrible things that I have done? Later, because of the grace of God, he was able to write, Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me. And I will be whiter than snow. Oh my friends. God's grace is enough to save you. It's enough to seal you. And it is enough. To change you. Now how do we respond to God's grace? Number one. You accept it. You take Jesus at his word. Jesus says come unto me all ye who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. This morning, accept God's grace. Tell him right now, God, I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve your grace, but I accept it. Will you accept it right now? Will you say, Lord, please forgive me of my sins. I don't deserve it. But the Bible and Brother Gene say you'll forgive me if I ask you to. That you'll come in and change me and cleanse me. If I ask you to, Lord. This morning I want to do that. Accept his grace. Secondly, trust his grace. When he says he has you in the palm of his hand, trust him. Quit worrying about it. It isn't going to change a thing. You rest in the grace that he offers. Some of the saddest people I know are Christians who go from day to day never knowing if they're still saved or not. They can be some of the most uptight people in the world. What a pitiful way to live. Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. He didn't call you to make you uptight and worrying. He called you, saved you, and sealed you to give you peace. Accept his grace. Trust his grace. And share his grace. When Jesus cast the demons out of the Gadarene demoniac and delivered him, the man wanted to follow Jesus, wanted to go with him. What did he do? He said, no. I want you to go and tell. Go and tell the people what I've done with you. Go and share with them the grace I've shown you. And sharing with others the grace that God has given us requires that we tell them the truth. What did John say in John chapter 1 and verse 14? We beheld his glory full of grace and what? Full of grace and truth. You see, anytime you find grace, you always find with it truth. Without truth, there is no necessity of grace. Without truth, grace is not required. The two of them always travel together. Truth and grace. Jesus told us in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. In John chapter 18 verse 37, when Jesus was confronting Herod, he said, I was born for this and I have come into the world for this to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. John chapter 8 verse 32, Jesus speaking to his disciples said, And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Grace requires that we tell people the truth. If I have a problem, I want my doctor to tell me what the problem is. If we need to operate, let's operate. 
I don't want him to rub some ointment on it, tell me that this will make it feel better and come back and see me again in two weeks if you're still alive. If I got a problem, I want him to tell me what the problem is and I want him to deal with it. When I'm dealing with the doctor, I want the truth so we can handle the situation. If I'm dealing with my mechanic, I want him to tell me the truth. Tell me what the problem is. Let's fix it. Don't put a band-aid on it so they'll leave me stranded on the side of the road somewhere. If my drains clog up, clog up and Joe has to come clean them out. I don't want him to clean them out and leave it at that. I want him to tell me the truth. Hey, dummy, quit dumping grease down the sink. It's going to happen again. We live in a time when people think telling the truth is unloving or ugly or something. But loving someone and showing them grace requires you to tell them the truth. How loving is it to sell a homeowner a paint job when you know that there's rot going on behind the wall? And that if they don't fix it, they're going to have a wall, well painted rot that'll soon collapse. How loving is it for a doctor to tell someone, well, we need to remove that toe because you have an infection? And yet not tell them the reason you have the infection is because you have diabetes and you need to cut sugar out of your diet. How loving is it of a counselor to tell a couple they need to work on their arguing without telling them Christ needs to be the center of their home because he's the one who designed the whole thing. How loving is it to embrace people in their sins without telling them the truth about a savior who came so they could escape the bondage and the consequences of those sin. Tell people the truth. The truth that John said many won't recognize. That there are two sides in this world. There are two teams. There is light and there is darkness. You are on one side or the other. You are a child of God or you are not. There is no halfway partially there. Tell folks the truth. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father but by me. Tell them the truth. And show them grace. Luke chapter 12 verse 48. We read, much will be required of everyone who has been given much. If, you've, if God has shown you grace, then be willing to show grace to others. I'm afraid that too many of us have forgotten how much grace has been shown to us by both God and by others. I'm afraid that we have forgotten how much grace God has shown us and so we become unwilling to show grace to others. I know I've sometimes allowed myself to forget about the log in my own eye. And I've become quick in pointing out the splinter in somebody else's eye. Do you remember the rules for women that went around on the internet some time ago? A husband speaking to his wife said, if I tell you something that it can be taken two ways, one way that upsets you and one way that doesn't, I meant it the way that doesn't. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you want your wife to cut you some slack, to show you some grace on what you say, then you better show her some grace in the things she says. Give her the benefit of the doubt. If you want your children to cut you some slack when you are unable to do something you told them you'd do, then you better cut them some slack and show them some grace when you interpret their hasty promises. If you want your friends to show grace when you inadvertently stick your foot in your mouth, then you better show them some grace. If you want your loved one to show grace when you forget to call, then you better show them some grace and give them the benefit of the doubt. We need to get the blooming chips off our shoulders and start showing one another grace. The same grace that God shows us. Share grace with others. The same grace that God gave us. Because it's enough to save us and to seal us. And to change us. And with that grace comes responsibility. 
Y'all remember that childhood rhyme? Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, here's another. Jesus Christ came to our wall. And Jesus Christ died for our fall. So that regardless of death and in spite of our sin, through grace he might put us back together again. <laughs>